I'm so happy to have Nora Casadro with me. And this is what your everyday life has become yes. at Premier Therapy Centers. Yes, I mean, this, 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 is our, this is our life. I mean, when we walk in to see you, besides the gorgeous, the absolute gorgeous backdrop, which yes. I would be remiss not to mention, um, <laughs> I mean, I would like that in my background. Like, let's just let's just say that I would love you know, Dan's it's work. Very possible to get that. Yes, <laughs> I have but, to know the artist. <laughs> the artist is your husband, so I, I will bring that up right right there. But Nora, I mean, four months ago, this is not how we would see you when we would walk into Premier Therapy Centers. No, it's a, and I'm not by patients right now, so I can dis disarm. <laughs> We are now, now I'm a naked face. <laughs> but I mean, first of all, you, I mean, you have done so much um, research to reopen, to get your patients back into being able to see you. I know because you and I happen to be in a women's networking group together. We have um, sat on Tuesday mornings with a whole bunch of incredible women who we have supported each other, talked to each other, um, worked together to say, how do we open these businesses? And you have educated a lot of us on, in particular, the PPE um, um, guidances of what you were just wearing. Um, okay. And you have also graduated along the way into yes, I'm now a doctor Nora. You're now a doctor, and we are, you know, I speak for our group. We're so proud of you. Um, but tell us about um, sort of what what happened along the way in the last four months, and to the fact that you now I know you have patients in your waiting room waiting for you. So I'm yes. thrilled that you're talking with me today. Well, a lot has um, changed as far as when patients enter the practice, um, you know, we're limited as amount of people that we have in. And when they enter our building, we, um, they have to be masked, obviously, but that's since the get go. Um, and we take their temperature and we do a pulse ox on them to see if they're at, um, they have to have a no temperature and their oxygen has to be over 90. We've had no problems with that. Um, but if we had a patient who came to us with a temperature and a pulse ox, we would, you know, uh, get them to refer them to an urgent care of their physician because it's really important that, that they um, you know follow up but we would not allow them to practice um, that being said you know we've had a wonderful um, array of clients that called us during the quarantine to see how we were doing as well and we, we did virtual visits we mailed masks to patients who were compromised who couldn't get out we actually dropped groceries off to people um, you know because we uh, you know, I feel like my practice is a, I've been in this community over 17 years, and these are my, my patients. Many of them have been with me for several instances of, of conditions. And, um, you know, I really am very blessed to have the team of people um, that are with me that are very supportive and not, you know, no one's fought to, to wear the shields, none of my employees. Um, they've all been extra di diligent about um, that, that issue. Um, so, you know, we've been just treating, you know, we have a lot of repeat offenders, we call them, when they come back, they trust us. Um, right. And uh, that's the big thing is having the trust. Like I wrote a little bleed that I'll post later about what we did to survive. And basically it was that we were genuine. We really care about our patients. And I think it wasn't about even billing insurance. It was about making sure people had the exercises, the bands sent to them, the masks, the things that they need. We had you know, I gave up the cell phone of myself and my partner, Rocky, to patients who had questions during their crises and if they needed us. We actually did go to a few patients' homes who were critical that we could treat, um, and, you know, because that's the kind of treaters we are, you know, and I think- Well, and I know, think that it was such an immediate shutdown that happened. I know, you know, I have a shoulder issue that I've worked through over the years and I go to Pilates or I walk and you know um all of a sudden not to be able to do any of those things and this is what you're talking about yeah. with your patients you you know you wake up one day you have an appointment and and you can't go yeah. your whole body 
your body knows you're supposed to be seeing you. Yes. I mean, well, that was what was interesting about like this. I was able to video conference patients and show them advanced exercises that they were, you know, doing when they left me, but they needed to upgrade. So we were uh -huh. able to do that with them and through the technology and actually, you know, you know, I use my kids as models or my husband or, you know, mm -hmm. uh, Rocky and I would show up once a week to go through an email answer. We had the phones checked through our um, homes so that we could stay up. Anyone who had a question, um, you know, it's, it seems like forever that this has been going on, even though yeah. it's like time going by. Um, I just really hope that this surge doesn't reset people back. I mean, we've had, you know, people um, calling us saying, you know, I've been exposed. Well, if they They've been exposed they can't come in you know we say you right. get you know 14 days and you need a test before you can come back in and um you know we're being extra vigilant even now more so telling you know definitely have that mask on definitely do they come in a hand sanitize the temperature and all that and we ask the questions of have you are you by someone sick I mean, mm -hmm. the, the thing is that we're relying on people being honest and i actually treat everyone like if they have it you know any patient that comes in i tell my staff you know you have to act like they have it to wear your mask you do, we the shield, you have that layer, they have their mask on, you know, and, and some of the times, you know, it's about educating people how to wear a mask, you know, you see people with it under their nose and, you know, yeah. my 75 year old teacher is not trying to be defiant. She just doesn't understand the, she didn't even know there was a little metal thing in it, the clip on her nose. So, you know, just going and, you know, being kind to people and giving them that option, you know, of just saying, you know, let me help you, you know, I've given extra masks to patients who, you know, if they're driving with people, you know, I say, you know, get, make that person wear a mask in the car with you, you know, because it's not that your daughter-in-law isn't been um, quarantined, but she's also maybe going to a grocery store and 16, you know, interface with mm -hmm. more people. So Correct. if they're driving the elderly, I say, you know, here's some extra masks that you offer. Just ask them politely to work for you. Um, and I think that's the thing that's hardest is that um, just, you know, I, I actually got in a, in a discussion with a driver of one of my elderly patients from a service and he didn't have a mask on. I, I confront him I see and she's a compromised elderly person who's at risk you cannot bring her here without a mask and you know I ended up calling the company and I won't mention any names but they were very um supportive and I you know I just I actually refused to treat the patient because I just can't trust that she was not exposed and and he wouldn't you know he was not right so that's the stuff that's hard you know um and it, I want and to introduce it, you to my partner Rocky <sighs> real quick here's a so Rocky was Rocky's been with me for over like 12, 14 years. So hi Rocky. Hello, how are you? Hi Rocky. It's so nice to. I'm so glad that you're back working and seeing patients. What kind of? Let me ask you. What kind of? Um, what kind of? Don't go away. No, no, you get in there. Oh, okay. <laughs> what kind of? Um, now that people are back, what kind of? Um, what do you see most? What What's been the the number one sort of ailment people are sort of got a lot of a lot of back issues. Yeah, sitting, sitting, sitting. <laughs> you know, everybody, everybody's working from home now, so it's right. all that posture, a lot of computer, a lot even neck pain now. We're seeing a lot of that yes. stuff compared to before. Yeah. What is it? The C three, C four, C five. Do I have all that? That's right. <laughs> yeah, C five. Yeah, C five, C six, the most common. Yeah. See, I've been doing my homework on you guys, but <laughs> uh, that and and the fact that we're all at home, we're all like during the day. I find myself all of a sudden going like this, and I'm like, oh no, that's right. I gotta, you know? I gotta shoulders back and shoulders uh, Nora. Back. Nora, I think about you all the time. Like I'm like I don't. Want to go see Nora and Rocky? <laughs> but yeah, we're, we're we're actually now starting to see some surgical cases yeah. come through some total knees, which was you know for many months we didn't have any surgical cases. Yeah, we're getting some post-operative, which is nice because patients who put off their surgeries who really need them, yes, you know they're actually more complicated because they got more conditions going on than when they first started because they walked wrong for two months before getting their knee done. So yeah. we are seeing that surge of, of new post-surgical, which is- Well, so because, because the surgeries all open for the most part June right. 1st. Right. So now you're, you're getting right. that rehab. And there rehab. are still many PT clinics that are not open yet. You know, mm -hmm. we've been um, you know, diligent about opening. We really only service uh, our original physicians that refer to us, but we're getting calls from other physicians saying, are you open? 
Um, we, you know, we're working through lunch. If we have any clients that are compromised, like we have a patient who's on a, like Hemira or something that would be an autoimmune deficient, we have them come during a time that there are no other patients here. We have private rooms. Okay. You know, so we're very, very careful with them and they trust us. And that's the thing that is most important is that we value their care so much that we're willing to not eat, you know, not that any of us can afford to lose a few pounds of right. cold <laughs> That's a whole different thing. Uh, ever again. <laughs> right. Being home, being home four months, that, that's a whole, whole different, um, whole different, whole different other problem. situation. Are you still seeing patients um, via the, the telehealth if you need to? Yes. As a matter of fact, many of my clients who are my snowbirds got stuck in Florida and um, they were like, they left me went to Florida, we're gonna come back and start their therapy again. And um, I've been working with them through the telehealth, doing home exercises, again, upgrading. So um, okay. I have several clients in Florida that are still, now I, I wish they were back here, um, but um, they're trapped down there basically because they, can, mm -hmm. they can't fly back. So we're doing right. you know, exercises with them online and or following up with them. And you know, sometimes it's just, they have just a question like, should I ice or heat and, you know, or just something yeah. that they trust somebody to tell them and then to get to the physician, you know, it's very tough. Like, and it's, and it's actually expensive too, because if you're on a fixed income that the telehealth visits aren't free, uh, we do a lot of, you know, courtesy stuff for our clients because, you know, we just, you know, we're on, you know, if someone calls me asking me, should I ice or heat? You know, 90% of the time I always say when in doubt ice, you know, if you're not sure you always ice it, but um, you know, that's very general. So, but don't, don't just do that. <laughs> <laughs> call and ask <laughs> what um how do people you know how do people know to see you like is it a referral from a doctor what what's the general rule as far as in general like a patient to we do have direct access in the state of Michigan so people can come in and just see us for PT but the insurance companies won't cover that that, you, that would be a self-pay we have a variety of patients who do that, but um, if the insurance and most patients, I say, if you have insurance, use it. You already paid for that. Um, then you need a physician's order to come into CPT. Um, but a lot of the clients are referred through other clients who are very happy with our care, and then they contact the physician and get the order sent in, and then we treat them. But you know, and and I, you see this wave and with this telehealth now, and you know that PT are become doctorate so that we could do direct access without the physician thing. And in many states, the insurance covers. The visits and there are certain insurance companies in Michigan that will cover PT without the order from the physician. But um, we, I see that changing in the next couple of years. That's why I went and got the doctorate degree so that I could be more viable to our practice. And I love that. I'm so proud of you. It's that's, you. I mean, it's a lot of work. You're a mom, a wife, you're working. I mean, that that in itself is just such a huge accomplishment. And, um, you know, I, uh, what, um, uh, another question I really had was, you know, the training, you, you know, I know the training now that you've gone through, what training do you expect of your staff or should one expect if they're looking for a physical therapist? Because I think that there's the gamut and how do we know if we're getting really good care? Well, a lot of times word of mouth, um, you know, reference from somebody who's already been to some place is really important, you know, um, in general, and this is a, another generalization, private practices tend to be better because they have to be, you know, they, they, they hang their own shingles, they have a lot on the line. So small private practices, and there's not a lot of us left, um, uh, they tend to have to be better because if you're not good, you know, um, but you know, specializations, like I'm an orthopedic manual specialist and, um, you know, with a spine background in orthopedics. And so different, uh, different certifications in PT are, are separate therapists out. And um, so when therapists graduate from PT school, in general, they're a generalist, you know, they can, they pretty much, you should be able to throw almost anything at them and then create a treatment plan. But, you know, that that takes years to become good at that. So a seasoned therapist is really worth their weight in gold, you know. So, you know, I not to diminish younger therapists, but the, it's like everything. The more experience experience you have, or groups that have seasoned therapists in them, so that the younger therapists can go access them. Those are the things like a, a one man dog and pony show of a new grad is certainly not anything I would recommend because then there's no you know, growth. Um, mm -hmm. you know, so training, advanced training, like ongoing training, we train 
every year we've been taking classes since I ever got out of PT school on, on and on and on. And um, it's now a requirement in Michigan, but it wasn't up until just recently. But I've always mandated my team that they have to annually take classes to enhance their skill set because it's just necessary. I, and I believe in that. Um, so any specialization. So you might see a PT, DPT, OMPT, or OCS, or CTH. These are all very difficult things to acquire in our field. You have to pass exams, and you have to have seasoned um, track record to be able to do them. Like most of these tests, you can't even sit for unless you have so many years experience. So um, those are important for, for people who really need that specialized stuff. You know, um, but in general, you know, uh, I would say stick to the smaller private practices if you're out and you know, that, that they tend to be better. Um, then ask around, you know, my Mahjong groups are probably my biggest referral base in this community. Um, they're just great. Um, but they're I also- I like that. I, and I like that only because I'm a firm believer in referral. I mean, you know, yeah. and my business is, is that way, but um, I, you know, I, I think that it's also, um, you know, it, it's, it, it, it comes with the good and the bad, as we all know. But right. The, the, the bottom line is you have to, in the medical profession, as a consumer of it, and, you know, you have to advocate at this point in your life. You, you have to advocate to, um, and that's why I say, you know, if I'm looking for something, what do I ask? And I always like to ask that of the professional. Right. I'm a, I'm and we're seeing that, Siri, people are becoming more discerning. You know, mm -hmm. you don't have like, you know, a bottomless pit of therapy dollars in it. You know, nobody does. And right. so clients are being discerning. You have, you know, 10, some people have rationed care where they only get five or six visits mm -hmm. and they have to be very functional visits, very fruitful visits. So we're really trying each time someone comes in to focus on what they can learn. So they learn so that they don't get you know, I think once you teach somebody something, then it's on them. You know, you really want right. to educate people about sitting, about posturing, about lifting, about mm -hmm. things that compromise their care. And a lot of times when we teach the patient, they say, oh, I was doing it all wrong. It's like, so education. Right. And then I'm getting a lot of phone calls into use of the phone by patients asking me, what is your expertise? Can you treat this? How many have you treated? And I think, you know, a, a good clinic's going to answer that call and, you know, and, and triage that person and say, you know, and when I've had people call and ask me about pediatrics, we don't do a ton of non-orthopedic pediatrics. We don't do neurogenic, which is like a CP kids or mm -hmm. neurogenic children. So I would not take that child. You know, sometimes we will, if they tell me I can't get into a clinic and there's something that the child needs, you know, I did do a small bout of children before. So I'll treat pretty much per free that kid until they can get in somewhere else. But I it's really not this practice that I would do that. And only in extreme cases, right. you know, when I was in Pontiac, there was a lot of things that were going on over there that we don't see in West Bloomfield. So there was some of that stuff that we would help these people because it was important to me to do that. And just as a professional, but you know, so, well, I definitely don't, I, you know, I'm very careful with the medical professional. When I talk to them, I'm grabbing you during the middle of your day. And I know that, um, is there anything that I didn't hit upon? Because I definitely want to make sure that people know about um, premiertherapycenters.com um, and to go to that um, and to ask those questions. I think that um, we've all been sitting on our little tushes um, and um, probably developing some bad habits. But the truth of the matter is that um, there, there are, I, I've noticed that more people are, are out exercising, doing things yes. that can put themselves in, in some harm's way. Right. Um, but you know, I really am very concerned about the elderly clients being told to stay in and not move. And they're already compromised. They're already having difficulty walking. They're already fearful. So to take this group of people and, and make it worse, it, you know, I think it, you know, get them up. If you have a family member at home that is older, you know, talk yeah. to them saying, get up, walk around five minutes, set the timer on the stove, walk for five minutes every couple hours. You know, mm -hmm. just there's a lot of very good chair YouTube videos that you can put up for an elderly person and, you know, advocate for your family member, particularly the elderly and, and communicate, try to maybe set a schedule up with your family that the grandkids one day a week contact that person. And I really think that that's 
the stuff that we're seeing is the loneliness with the older patients yes. coming in. We're, we're the only people that they've interfaced with this whole time. And they're, you know, they're telling me about standing outside a window and seeing their kids and it's wearing them out. I mean, this has become not, yeah. not a month, not in this is, I just see them breaking down. And I really feel like that's a side of this, that the elderly client or the really compromised person at yeah. home is, is just needs that, um, the love, you know, we just need to be, we, we, we and have, we, pro be. we have proven that we are a society that needs touch and love. And um, I agree with you because um, it's the one thing with my mother-in-law, my, my parents, I've said, even in March and April, walk to the mailbox carefully, walk around your home, make sure there's nothing in the way, you know, but you, you got to get up. I, myself, I am, I am terrible about sitting at my desk all day long, other than to go get another cup of coffee. I know. And I'll get up at the end of the day and, and be all creaky in my shoulders and everything and, and be like, oh, why? And think, oh, because I didn't get up all day. Right. You know, and we and really recommend only 45 minutes of sitting and then you got to get up and walk. And that's why, you know, the phone has a little timers, you know, set a two minute timer that you get up and just walk, you know, just move. Yes. Um, I can't stress it enough. The body is a mobile machine. If we don't move it, if you don't use it, you lose it. So you've got to get moving And you know, and I've been encouraging people since it started to get up and get around walk. I mean, I think in our meetings, I'm like, make sure you're getting outside, get your vitamin D walk, you know, and, yes. you know, but you know, some of the people that are in some of these communities, right, retirement communities, they were like jailed. They're not allowed to walk in the hallways and their units are very small. I mean, I had one man whose place was so small, he was tripping over the furniture. Mm. And, um, you know, so then you're in this dilemma, like it's very, very concerning, um, what's going on in some of these areas, but I, I'm hoping that it'll improve soon. Yeah, it's that it's that tough balance of giving them exercises in that small space to get up, whether it's just standing up at the bed or a chair, right. but also compromising them to if they walk in a hallway, there could be somebody. Right. Yeah. You know, it. I mean, you have you you have a a tough a tough job, but thank God when they do get to see you, they get. They get you behind the shield and the mask so they don't get your gorgeous smile, but they can see it in your eyes. Well, they, they know have a wonderful artwork. <laughs> they have, oh my God, they have Dan's gorgeous artwork, which is yeah. just brightens everything. We try to make day. it a very upbeat environment for our clients. Yes. You know, we engage with them and you know, we really, we're very, you know, I love people I'm a, and I just love what I do. And yeah. um, you know, I'm, I'm very lucky to have a job like this. And um, when you, when you, serve people and you actually watch them get better and you teach them to work and they they say you know i hate you but i love you because you yeah. um you know and, and we I, have to I say like, i i say it feel it it it, yeah. it hurts so good you're screaming don't do it <laughs> right. you back in, it's like such a such a tough thing you know right you know? but having secure you have to secure your client knowing that you know i tell them that it's going to hurt but it's not going to hurt you you know, right. knowing that, like as a professional, knowing when, and I can't, that's the difference, you know, and I, I feel like if you can secure your client or your patient and say, this might hurt, but it's, it's going to be for your benefit. And I try to tell my, yeah. patient, you didn't do this need to settle. You're not, not going to settle for not good enough. So let's wrap our head around the fact that this is temporary pain. We'll get through this because we want to get the best case scenario out of what they did. You know, you want right. to do the best and, and have them on board on that. And that partnership, I, that's what I like about my client base here is that I have a very educated, smart, discerning, critical, demanding, <laughs> like you, like your client base as well. But hey, you we love it. We, you like know, playing tennis with somebody who's better than you, you know, you yeah. get better. So, um, well, yeah. go to it. Thank you. I, so. Thank you so much for spending some time with me. Everybody head over to premiertherapycenters.com. You will get information from Dr. Nora Casardo. And I can't thank you enough. I really do. I know how busy you are and, and staying busy. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. Be safe too.